I am Michael Hoffman. Uh, lessons learned from creating training courses, and it's kind of a nice follow-up to Rand's uh, discussion because I was actually motivated to uh, to record and, and kind of share my knowledge, uh, which leads into this talk. So. Uh, I am a uh, developer slash architect slash just a little bit about everything uh, for a company called Divizia. Uh, we're in downtown Chicago. Uh, so this is kind of the story of my journey uh, into creating, uh, creating these training courses. I started out and I said, I got all of this information and I love to talk a lot, so I want to try to combine them somehow. Uh, so I started to look at different ways that I could share with the tech community. Uh, I started out looking at, uh, there we go, uh, tutoring, which seemed kind of fun. Uh, and then I signed up for a couple of the tutoring sites, etc., and got weird spam and got a little freaked out. Uh, also started talking to people with tutoring who were like, hey, you know, I got my finals tomorrow and I never went to a class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I can't teach you Java in five hours. So uh, tutoring was a failure. I uh, tried open source, I tried sharing with the community through that, uh, got into analysis paralysis. I really, really didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't want to fix bugs because that's kind of boring. And I developed during the day and I wanted to do something that was going to be kind of meaningful. Uh, you know, I really was looking for something that was satisfaction, et cetera. So I uh, had a friend reach out to me. Uh, he uh, reached out about five years ago. And uh, he said, hey, you know, we've worked in this company. They're mostly a Microsoft company uh, offering up training. Uh, would you be interested in creating courses? Uh, so let me divert a little bit because I'm just kind of curious to hear uh, uh, just opinion. Uh, how many of you have a CS background? OK, uh, for the ones that don't have a CS background, did you have like math or some other? Uh, did you go through like a university program? Oh yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so everybody went pretty much to your university. Okay, next question is, for all those people that had a CS degree, how many of you are also interviewing candidates? Okay, uh, how many of you that, of those three or four that are interviewing candidates right now have had a candidate come in and say, I don't have a CS degree, I've gone through a boot camp or online courses? I see the... the um, this is coming. It, it's happening, like yeah. more than you can imagine. Uh, so online training back five years ago, I had, I had no idea who Pluralsight was. I'm on the Java side of, of the world. Uh, I do like Microsoft, nothing against it, but uh, I, had, I had no idea that online training, it, to, to Rand's point, you know, YouTube was kind of the only thing I saw people you know, using regularly for video courses. Um, so I had some concerns. I didn't really know if this was going to be a worthwhile venture. It kind of felt a little like tutoring. And then I said, well, let me jump into it and see, you know, try it out, right? Um, and sure enough, uh, here we go. Um, it's really been probably one of the best experiences in my career. Uh, and I can say that, you know, after five years with a lot of confidence. Um, I get to engage with a really wide audience. It's been a lot of fun, uh, especially being able to just talk to people who watch the course and then email me and say, hey, we want to set up a Skype discussion because I have no idea what you're talking about in this one part. And so I have to essentially reiterate it. Uh, but it gives me that little bit of one-on-one, -on -one, but I feel like I'm actually teaching and tutoring people. Um, it's improved my presentation skills. I hated talking to people. Uh, I definitely hate being videotaped, but I'm being videotaped. Um, I, I just, I hate myself in, in, in any type of video, but um, it, it improved that and it helped when you know, I'm out at a customer or a client talking to people. Um, my own technical abilities, I was able to deep dive into technology a little bit more than I usually do, right? Because we're, most of us, I think, are all kind of working at that like non-specialist layer because we have to be an expert at everything and, so um, this gives you the ability to, to dive a little deeper into stuff that I kind of felt like I knew uh, and really had to teach it more than just spew out documentation or, or give some little experience. Um, 
There's also a little bit more of financial justification because, uh, to be honest with you, it takes a long time, and you know, I think there needs to be a little bit of uh, a reward for that that's outside of just you know the uh, uh, personal gains. So, um, kind of get into what those lessons learned were, like what that journey looked like. Uh, the first thing was like course selection. I started out. I said I have no idea what I'm going to talk about, um, and one of the things that I weighed, and if, you know, you were interested in taking sort of that whole podcast aspect and taking that to the next level of creating larger pieces of content. Um, one of the questions I had is, do I talk about something that I'm an expert on, or that I don't really know too well? Um, and I've actually done both sides of it now. But I started out with the expert. Uh, I I knew a couple of open source products very very well, so I ended up talking about them. Um, it makes it so much easier when you're an expert. I really like it a lot more. Uh, but you can kind of do that, that I'm picking up a new technology. I want to learn it and also talk about it. Um, being an expert, you can really get into like experiences and kind of inject uh, uh, your own horror stories or whatever else you might have. Uh, depth of the course content, this was a real struggle for me. Uh, when I started out trying to select what I wanted to do, I said, hey, I'm going to talk about everything with Apache Camel because, yeah, we'll do it all. And then, yeah, it's going to be a seven and a half hour long video, um, which is just crazy. So uh, I started out, I, I did too much, and I found that you know it's really good and kind of the way Pluralsight structures it is, uh, you've got sort of that getting started, and I think that really is a good way to, to approach a topic. And then take the deep dive into like the patterns and what it's really trying to solve and providing you know, more depth around it. Um, you gotta be excited about the topic. I wasn't about my first topic, and it was really showing through as I started recording. Um, and kind of keeping the goals, I found that this was a really important thing. Uh, this is even in the podcasting you know, realm, but uh, one of the problems I ran into in my first course was I was like, hey, Developers don't know how to set up the, the project in the ID, so I'm going to talk about the ID setup, and I'm going to talk about testing, and I'm going to talk about this. And it, again, it blew up, and it got just too big, it was too much to handle. So I started setting goals up front, and I said, I'm only going to talk about this stuff, and if you want to learn how to do that other stuff, go somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of how I got through course selection. Um, creating the content. The whole goal of these courses, or at least that I found, was documentation sucks. It really does. It's boring, right? It's very product specific. For the most part, when you read it, you're kind of looking or trying to cherry pick for some things. But it usually doesn't provide like, real world examples. I really enjoy the courses because I can get into details that I find that are gaps, or I can go across documentation and, and you know, different uh, resources and be able to pull in real information that you know somebody would have to otherwise go across like 15 stack overflow uh, um, uh, answers in order to get. So that was actually a challenge for me at first because when I did start out, I tried creating documentation. Um, it was very documentation like. Uh, however, like I said, as I as I matured and, and grew in that, that was. One of the things that really kind of opened my eyes. And when you start out too, you start to think, well, there is all of this content out there. I'm just kind of reinventing the wheel. But the reality is you're not. Um, people do like to see things in different ways or, or view things in different ways. Um, so there's still opportunity. Uh, focusing on verbs and tasks. This was a big issue of mine too. When I started out, I tried to just say, like, this is pattern one, and this is pattern two, and this is pattern three, and then people would drop off in the analytics. Uh, people really like to see, okay, let me start by creating the project. Now create this, now do this, now do that. Um, so when I create my courses now, it's very action-based, and I can kind of show that in a minute. Um, just the time learning, this was another problem I had. Uh, so I'm 
Um, this is also kind of a difference between the documentation and what like online courses can provide. A lot of times like documentation will spew out a bunch of theory or a bunch of the background or get into all of the concepts, but you're not actually doing anything yet. And if I'm reading a document, I kind of drop off at a certain point because yeah, I've read all of this, but I really want to apply something, or I just need to answer something. Um, so the shift is with at least the online courses that I'm doing is um, I focus less now on sort of that uh, uh, big bang of here's all of the concepts, now let's demo everything. Um, I really try to, here's a concept, here, let me actually give you the application of it and demo it. And, and kind of try to revisit as I'm going along but it's very uh, narrowed down to that. Uh, another thing is, and it's one of the challenges with the courses is um, they do take a lot of time to ramp up. One of the reasons I take a long time to ramp up is because I have to script out my course. Uh, it's just easier for me to read. It feels more natural when I talk. Uh, some people script though, and they sound like a robot. It's like, I think you should learn this. It is good. Um, I. I find scripting is good because I don't have that issue. Uh, there's some authors who totally improv and they're able to just off the cuff talk about stuff. Uh, it's pretty amazing. I'm nowhere near as smart as they are. So um, uh, I do actually a lot of scripting, but unfortunately it takes a lot up front. When you're doing your scripting, are you breaking down like an outline and then, or do you have like, I'm going to say this. Like yeah. how, how, how much do you go into? So script? I've got, uh, let's see if I can do that. There we go. So what I do is I use OneNote, and um, at least for anything that I'm talking to a PowerPoint slide, I'll literally write out the text in full. Um, as I get more into like, uh, you know, say here about like the verb, so adding, configuring, creating, etc. Um, as I get down into demos. Bring that one over. What I actually just do is I. See if I can. Duplicate that. Uh, so what I actually do with the uh, with the demos then is I I kind of give a uh, sort of just general tasks that I need to do and I'll just sort of talk to them as I'm walking through the demo, because I don't, I find it's really, really hard to demonstrate something and be reading a script. Uh, and again, sort of to, to what Rand's setup is, um, I know some people will actually do the demo and, and then record the video and audio of themselves talking and then uh, overlay essentially the, the video of their uh, demo, of them typing, of them being able to show that on the screen, but it's recorded separate and you can merge them in. Uh, use, I'll talk to that a little bit, uh, Camtasia for that. Um, but that's, that's kind of the setup I use. And hope this work. Or not. So, awkward. Uh, kind of talked about that leading into demos. Um, uh, so that's, that's kind of where I was getting at with the, you know, kind of talking about a concept, getting into the application and, and applying it. Uh, consistency of terminology. This is actually a big issue, believe it or not. Um, Viewers get really angry when you call things different, uh, differently throughout the course, as I found out uh, in my first course. So uh, yeah, they, because they get tripped up, right? They, they like heard something and they're like, wait a minute, that doesn't. So, um, I, I, and that's also to the scripting part, I find the scripting gives me some consistency. If I call it differently for some reason, which I do occasionally, um, I can go back and check. 
Uh, keeping the video moving, this is actually a really interesting concept because uh, Pluralsight enforces you to have something happen on the screen every 20 seconds. Uh, and the reason being is, is that a lot of times, you know, if you're doing like a demo or doing something that you're talking to, if I'm just watching it and nothing's moving, I'll tend to kind of move away and be like, oh, my phone's here, ooh, cookie. Um, so it, it keeps the user you know, engaged, basically. Uh, and I, and it, they use analytics to, to kind of prove this out. Uh, if your video is not moving, people will turn off, uh, which is kind of interesting. So getting a little bit into recording uh, the course, and again, this is, I thought it was really nice to have Rand's, uh, and he gets a lot more into details than I do. Uh, but kind of keeping distractions to a minimum. Uh, I record in an office, in my own home office. Uh, you know, as far as, you know, equipment goes, I can get into that a little bit too if you're interested. But um, breaking up the demo, uh, so I talked to this a little bit. I actually, I do split up my recording in that way. It's kind of a nice way to, to have the, the audio track and kind of what I'm doing, and then be able to overlay the video of the demo, uh, which I can talk to. Uh, Camtasia is really great for extending video or being able to kind of modify things. Sometimes I do have to re-record, uh, but it, it's usually somewhat minimal. Um, I've learned to hate breathing because Oh, it's like when I started, I, I had, and so this is the biggest uh, issue with editing, is that as you're breathing, you know, you're you're like talking, you're really excited, and all of a sudden you're like, and that ah, is, and users hate that. Like, I I I don't, I'm not able to get rid of all of them, but I get rid of a lot of them. Um, so try to avoid breathing as much as possible. Well, then uh, the podcasters call that mic technique. Yeah. You have to have good mic technique, which is a learned skill. You don't automatically have good mic technique. Mm -hmm. If you're using a high-quality microphone, it starts picking up things. I right, actually, it'll pick up everything. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> actually, uh, I watched videos on, um, on people who were training for uh, uh, vocal lessons, like voice lessons, uh, to be able to talk to, uh, from the diaphragm, uh, being able to breathe properly. And all of that stuff helped. And I didn't think it would because I was like, hey, I'm not really, uh, I certainly don't say, and, and won't break into song now, but, um, but yeah, it was, that was very helpful. But I still, uh, I still do breathe occasionally. Some of the software is actually pretty good for that as well. Uh, so I use, uh, I was saying, uh, I don't know if I get into this, but um, for like recording equipment, I use Camtasia. Uh, Camtasia is a TechSmith product. It used to be really, really expensive, and now they got it on subscription, so you can kind of pay as you go, which is not as bad, but it does the audio and video editing. Uh, and it does some of the audio normalization that, that you were talking about. Um, I think that's a screen capture program that runs on your, your laptop, right? Yep. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the Mac setup. I was going to show it, but yeah, it runs on your laptop. Um, I have a Rode Podcaster, so I, I went with a Podcaster. It's a podcaster boom and arm. And between the three of them, I paid about $400. And it's good, but I'm part Italian, so I talk with my hands. And every once in a while, I hit the mic, or I hit a chord, and then all of a sudden, you hear a big buzz. So um, I, I actually am trying to switch to like doing a, um, uh, a headphone set, which and I'm getting into that. The reason I really like the Rode Podcaster is because it was a direct USB connection to the computer. So I didn't have to have anything in between, like uh, you're talking about like a preamp. I wanted to go to the headset, but the headset requires the preamp, but that is expensive. So I was looking at like another $300. So it's an option, but at least then I can get, you know, movement when I talk. Uh, pop filter is also important because I tend to tend to pop a lot, so um, but those are pretty cheap. Uh, I say, even for working remote, I do a lot of remote work, and it's having a pop filter in front of your microphone, it makes the day a little bit easier. Yep. What's a pop filter for those who don't know? So it's, uh, it's basically like a, like a sock, like a sleeve, right, that they put on this, like, it depends on how you want to do it, but um, either does it around a big circle, so when you talk, you, you get like a popping sound, it, it will uh, lessen that. 
Um, if you do the headphone set, they've got it already kind of built in. Uh, Rode is supposed to have it with Podcaster, but it sucks. Um, and it, everything else is great about the microphone, but that that sucks. I still get a lot of issues with uh, with popping. So, um, so that's most of my recording equipment. Uh, to your comment too, I do actually. It's really weird. I record with the um, uh, soundproof headphones, and, and they're the nice stereo ones. But hearing your voice as you're talking is so odd. It takes so long to get used to. Um, but it, yeah, it's it's almost vital to, to do it. Um, trying to think of what else for recording equipment. Uh, we record at 720p. Uh, I I have done video where, but it's like a, a in person thing, which is kind of nice. But uh, I try not to record myself as much as possible, or at least my face. Uh, and why is it so important to hear yourself with your? Uh, because of the noise check. Uh, what I find is, is every, to the comment of moving my, my mouth, like I'll hear myself and, I'll say, and I'm like, oh, I, I moved away from the microphone again. Uh, so I have to stop myself. Uh, so that was really the big reason. I, I gotta say, I've made a couple of uh, little, you know, short recordings. I use something called Cam Studio, which is a, a free thing, but has its limits. Like. You get like 15 minutes, 12 or 15 minutes is, your, is before it runs out of space. But I'm running it on a 32-bit machine. But, um, I bought an $80 Logic Tech wireless headset with a, with, a, with a little boom on it. Mm -hmm. And I don't have any of those problems. And it's very good that it, it, ignoring background noise because the microphone stays at the exact same spot relative to your mouth. You don't have any of those issues of turning your head or... That's, and that's part of why I also want to move to it, because, yeah, I, I just... It's, it's not 300 bucks, it's like 80 bucks for... I, I will say, don't don't get a Bluetooth one, because they have their issues. This is, you know, they're like two and a half gigahertz short, you know. It's a dedicated uh, wireless thing, it's not Bluetooth. And even if I even if I actually stand up or walk away and come back, you, you can't even tell that that's, that's happened. That's nice. But. Yeah, I, my mistake was I, I paid four hundred dollars and, and uh, <laughs> I was like, you know, I'm kind of I'm invested now and oh, I yeah. can switch. So now it's been five years. Studio mics are just a lot sexier looking. So um, that's that was it. Uh, I can I I guess. I don't really have too much else. Um, I, anybody else have any other questions? I, I guess that kind of covers it. Anybody else want to know? Um, how many courses have you done, or how many sections? Or, I've done, uh, so I have six courses. Two of them were in person. I don't really count those as courses. Uh, the other four, one of them was a, a real deep dive into Apache Camel. It's like a, a, an integration mediation framework. That one almost lasted about five hours. It took me about six months from start to end to do it, uh, just because there was a lot of re-recording, editing, et cetera. Editing takes a, a, quite a long time. Uh, just being able to splice things together. Uh, I do a lot of demos where I, I demo multiple times, trying to get it right. Uh, so, so, yeah, that's that's and how point. much how much effort do you put? You said you would do a full time job. Obviously, this is not your main. This is a part time thing for me. So uh, how much hours in a week over the course of six months do you put into a course? I see. So the initial courses that I did was, and I was pretty inexperienced. I counted hours and I got about four hundred total hours over a six month period. Mm -hmm. um, I was able by about the fourth course to knock that down to about one hundred and fifty to two hundred hours. Right. From, from start to finish for about a two and a half, three hour course, uh, which isn't bad. And, and that's just because I'm still not as good as, you know, I guess if you're doing this consistently, like a full time job, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you get really good at just being able to sort of improv and demo and such. Um, I, I still, I find my mind wanders. <laughs> And I'll be demoing and I'll be talking about stuff and I'm like, oh, this is really cool too and such and such. And it's like, yeah, yeah, cut all that out. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, you, you waste a little bit of time. But so that, that's one thing I was going to ask is 
how much is Pearl site helping you edit, or is it you have to create the course, record it, and do all the editing yourself, or are they have options to help you edit it? Or? When I started, they were much more involved. Uh, they were helping with audio quality and audio normalization, some of the stuff you're talking about uh, in, in your discussion. So um, I'm now more responsible for, for that, especially the, the audio levels uh, is a big issue. So uh, they, they kind of help you, but I've, I've had to sort of do some of that myself. Uh, they don't edit, uh, they offer services that you can pay for it, uh, but they don't edit the actual video for you. So I have to edit and splice video, uh, reduce audio quality, uh, or I'm sorry, audio, uh, uh, and improve quality. Uh, any type of like after effects that I add, so I'll add like arrows and selectors and stuff into the video. Um, I do all that through Camtasia. That's all stuff that I do as well. Uh, then they help. They help with the publication, basically, uh, making sure that it goes into their software, etc. Uh, you have to define a whole bunch of metadata about your about your course, um, so people can find things inside your tracks and add notes, etc. And then they approve the final course. There's some approval process. Do they kick it back if something is wrong and give you feedback and say? Every, so they, they ask you to break things up into uh, a modular structure. Uh, and generally, modules are, are anywhere from, they, they say that most of their viewers are people who are sitting on a train and have a half hour, or they're sitting at lunch and have like half hour, 45 minutes, and they want to digest something within that half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, most people actually turn up the speed of the recording. Uh, so that's another thing. Like as I talk, um, I've had to learn that I have to talk very fast. And I, I don't know if everybody does this, but apparently uh, uh, most people they turn up the video to be like one and a half times, um, and will watch it within that half hour, forty five minutes. So they try to break the modules down. Every module gets reviewed for quality of the, the content and the sound, etc. And then they give you feedback. What is their compensation model as far as your, you know, all of plural site? If you get, is it compensated based on how many people pick your course? It's or not. Is well, it, first of all, it's not good enough that I've quit my full time job. Well, well no, understood. Um, <laughs> it's uh, so it was a royalty model when I got when I started it uh, uh, with it. They were very devoid of. Java content, so they were paying out a little higher of a royalty percentage, maybe like basically an upfront amount. Okay. Um, it's nothing, I mean, maybe like a month's salary worth for like the upfront payment once you deliver. Uh, and then the royalty payments are really kind of dependent on the content. Uh, they know what's usually what's going to be popular and what's not. Right. So um, I've not anywhere near like the levels of popularity of some people, but um, it's enough where if I worked, like my, I, I went back to like, if I worked my actual job for overtime um, in order to make up the, the 200, 300 hours that I was saying, um, you know, it would take me like a year or two to make that back. So you kind of go back from there of like how much you're making. Um, and, and you know, the compensation model is good enough where I know they're one of the better ones. Uh, Linda is out there, um, a few other ones that are out there as yeah. well. Uh, there are some that are actually taking like the tech talks like you're talking about and um, allowing you to host them. It's not a YouTube, but it's it, that, that seems to be kind of the next step uh, where those tech talks get turned into sort of these, these courses basically. Um, and people are paying for it. Um, maybe not as much as like, the plural site course because they're trying to really be an educator versus you know a platform for tech talks. But um, but there's yeah there's payment models out there for that as well. Okay. Usually it's uh, it's subscription plus a pool of you know whatever the profit was, um, and they kind of meld that together. Okay. So plural site their delivery model closer to Netflix as far as people just pick stuff and watch it or is it are you familiar with 
or Udemy, I think it's called. I'm from, yeah, Udemy. Where is they it. they expect you to write a course and they expect you to um, interact in some cases with any student who signs up for that course. Is it's the, optional for it is plural okay. site. Um, I do it because I I I like it. I like having that uh, kind of personal touch because it improves by other you know, courses as I go. Uh, but it's not required. They do have that, that model, though. Um, their delivery model is, uh, I say maybe like Netflix, but uh, they're trying to go more towards roadmaps. It's sort of to the point of Netflix of, you know, if you watch this course, here's some other courses that are popular and are related to this. That could be a next step. You know, you've gone through the, here's what AngularJS is. Now here is applying AngularJS, uh, uh, you know, in some model. So they're they're smart enough to be able to do that. But their clients are paying like a, a monthly subscription for you, and they yeah. watch a li you know up to a limit or unlimited videos, as opposed to like Udemy, you have to buy the course. Yeah. It's unlimited for for them for Pluralsight. Yeah, and uh, I, I notice too if, if they are really going after companies uh, to say, hey, you know what. You don't need a training budget where you're sending people out to these training courses. Just sign up for this and get our contract, and it's kind of like a gym membership. And you'll just every year you'll have people using it. And they can watch whatever they want. Watch whatever, whatever they, want. they want to learn, they can go after. Them. Yeah. The only thing I don't like is is that I think some companies are using the analytics that come with it to evaluate their people, which I don't, I don't think that's a good thing. But hearing that. Um, what I mean by that is, I've signed up for Pluralsight as you know my training provider, and I'm going to be able to see every one of my employees and how much time they spend on Pluralsight training and how much they're actually or what they're looking at, um, and using that as kind of an evaluation. Uh, so I have heard that from a couple of people that I was like, uh, it makes sense if the company's paying for it. it it makes sense, but it's it's kind of I don't know. It's, if there's if they're eavesdropping on an employee who signed up on a, on their own, that's definitely. Yeah, I yeah, that's kind of what I fear. <laughs> so it's something to watch out for, and that's not Pluralsight's fault. It's just I think sometimes people sign up and do these things. So, anyways, I'm sorry. There's another person, right? So okay, uh, I'll I'll end. Apologies. Yeah, I don't know.